Hello everyone, Earl Henderson, Primordial Defense, thank you for watching. I have another Monday quarterback video for you. I'm going to play this video and talk about things that are going on to better explain what's going on and talk about things that I think that are being done right and or done wrong. This video um, does not have a spokesperson for it. Uh, there's no person explaining anything that's going on or anything like that. Uh, the footage, as far as the dash cam goes, I tried to find the originating source on it as far as a governmental entity. Could not find it. Uh, instead, I found it being hosted on a channel on YouTube called Minnesota Safety. Um, it's a channel that describes itself as uh, talking about traffic safety in Minnesota and bringing awareness to traffic safety and transparency, stuff like that. Um, there's also some footage that comes from Minnesota Department of Transportation uh, because during this incident, um, a person was operating the camera and was able to pan and tilt it and capture the incident. Um, and then some footage is going to come from uh, a news agency where they interview the bystander who comes out and helps the trooper. So um, this occurred uh, on January 3rd of 2021. So it's a little old, uh, but not too old. A guy by the name of Matthew Cleave uh, wrecked his vehicle. Uh, this guy had a suspended license and had three previous uh, DWI convictions um, or DUI, driving under the influence or driving while intoxicated, whatever. Um, and he crashed out and got out of the car. Trooper arrives. He starts to walk away from the trooper. Uh, trooper goes to detain him fight starts they go to the ground and the guy tries to get the trooper's gun out of his holster um, and then a bystander comes up and helps and the guy gets put in cuffs there are some more <laughs> uh, to this guy about what happened to him after this and I'll get to that point a little bit later uh, but this is just kind of a synopsis of what's going on in the beginning so uh, I'll go ahead and, and play the video I'll have it on mute for a little bit because at the Minnesota safety YouTube page um, The person is just basically talking about some of the same stuff that I was talking about trying to you know Basically give, give you the synopsis of what was going on So the trooper is going to this call uh, I'm assuming that the uh, the car camera is in buffer mode because at first you don't hear anything in the background As far as like you know in car camera noise but it could be there was noise, but it was just muted out by the original poster of this video. Now, as he approaches uh, the scene right here, the scene's going to be over here on the other oncoming lane over here. And you can actually see uh, the tire marks here in the median. Right there. So this guy was traveling this direction, went off the damn road, and then... Bam! Hit this uh, right up in here. This this retaining wall. And you can see his marks going through there, and then hits the wall right there. So there's a couple people who've stopped to help him out. Um, and then we'll we'll throw the audio on now. And of course he's got you know red and blues on, but none of these dummies want to stop for him. <laughs> It was also reported that the tires were spinning um, on the vehicle, so it's like he left it in gear. Yeah. 
underground fighting. You don't have authority over me. You don't have authority over me. Do not reach for my fucking Do not reach for my fucking You don't have authority over me. Okay, so he has found himself in a situation that really fucking sucks. He's lucky that the dude did not get a good hit on him. He only knocked his hat off. Um, that could have been a, a pretty decent decentralizing hit if he had made contact. But it looks like all he did was hit the trooper hat. Now, I don't know anything about this Matthew Cleave guy, but notice how he... He maneuvers himself. So in jujitsu, this is uh, referred to as a side control. Um, so I don't know if the dude was just lucky that you know he kind of took this position, or if he kind of has an idea of what he's doing and has taken this position to to get some dominance over this officer. Um, it can be a hard position to get out of, or, you know, it can be a position that you can get out of, um, with some relative ease. It just depends on your skill level, um, body size, your proficiency with it, etc. So, um, in traditional, you know, BJJ, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, uh, no one's wearing a uniform. You know, no one's wearing a duty belt and a vest or anything like that. So, you can see um, people escaping out of these holds relatively easily. Right? It's a lot more difficult to do when you get all that shit on. Um, there are some ways that this officer could have um, escaped out of this. Um, but... Uh, because he has a, a duty belt on, he has a gun on the side that he's now having to maintain weapon retention of, uh, that changes things a little bit as far as how he can use his hands uh, to, to get out of that hold. Um, in traditional Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, um, you, know, you can very easily use both hands, both arms, um, and perform some different maneuvers to, to be able to escape out of that. Because you don't have a gun on your side to worry about. So the gun being on his side now changes things. So there's some things from the traditional stuff that he won't be able to do. But he can still do stuff like uh, bridging. He can um, uh, thrust his hips up. Drive that guy upwards a little bit. Uh, gain him some, some working room. And then start to shrimp out from under the guy. Uh, where he would basically, uh, once he thrusts his hips up and, and moves the guy upwards... He could then come back down and land on his uh, his right side, his gun side, um, and then kick his feet, drive his feet in, and kick himself out from under the guy. And if he gains a position there to be able to drive one of his feet into the dude's hips, into his pelvic area, then he can start to push that guy away. And then if he gets you know a really good um, position. And opening, he can even stomp the dude in the fucking face. So it's hard to, to verbalize this stuff and, and explain it uh, without providing any visuals. So the best thing I can tell you to do is do a search on YouTube for uh, uh, side control escape um, to get an idea of some of the things that I'm talking about. Um, Aside from being able to to do something like that, um, his other options are to do a in-fight weapons access. Um, 
the the gun itself he is trying to retain and keep it in so that guy cannot get a hold of it it would not be in his best interest to go ahead and unholster that thing and, and bring it out with the intentions of using it because then that could make it easier for this guy to start manipulating control over it and possibly get it out of his 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 control uh, but his his non-dominant side, his his left side of his body, he at minimum has a taser there, and so the taser is something that he could access while he's on the ground. Uh, his right hand is pushing down on the gun, keeping it down into the holster, and that dude's trying to fight for it, but he's pressing down into it. Um, and then his left hand can go down to the holster for the taser, undo it, bring the taser out. Um, now how his taser is set up, that could be an easy way to do it, or it could be a harder way to do it. So there's two ways for a taser to be worn. Uh, the traditional way is a cross draw method, meaning that it's, it's set up in a way that the, the hand that you would use to shoot your handgun with, you just reach across your body. It's cross draw, reach across your body, your body over to the other side. Where the taser is and then pull the taser out um, and then the other way is the taser is still kept on your support side but the holster is different and it's just a straight draw for your non-dominant hand so it'd be kind of like a you know like an old western cowboy gun belt where you got two holsters on each side um, his right side of course would be for the lethal gun and then his left side the holster would be for the taser so if he has that uh, straight draw set up of course that's going to be way easier for him to draw that taser out uh, if he has the cross draw method then he's going to have to pull that taser out basically upside down and then work the taser around in his hand to get it into the position that he needs it to to be able to actuate it and put it into play <clears throat> now with that taser being so super close to this guy he's not going to be able to achieve spread with the probes to achieve NMI, neuromuscular incapacitation. So he would have to do a, pros, a close proximity firing uh, into some part of the guy's body and then take the gun itself and then ram the end of the gun into another part of the guy's body to complete that circuit. So if he was going to do that, then as far as the close proximity firing goes, there's two options at this point one if he can fire into the into the guy's calf that could work and then take the end of the gun and ram it into the dude's buttocks or into his lower back area to try and achieve nmi that way or because this is now a deadly force encounter and that guy is trying to get his gun out this 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 trooper is is justified in using deadly physical force another person coming up is justified in using deadly physical force in this moment. So because this is a situation where deadly physical force is now something that would be justified to be used, he could take that taser and reach across and shoot the dude in the fucking head with the taser. Now, taser training says don't shoot people in the head, but there's a caveat to that, and it is in writing that you can see that says that... Um, you know, in situations where, you know, deadly physical force would be warranted, then of course, you know, you can deploy the taser and do that no-no zone. So, but that would depend on the angles and if he was able to, you know, get that kind of shot. But uh, if he could, I think that would be a great way to uh, deploy taser into that guy, uh, fire two probes right into his, his fucking head, <laughs> and then take the gun itself and ram it straight into his fucking ass. Uh, or his lower back area. Just ram it in there, complete that circuit. You got two probes up at the head, and then you got the gun itself doing your follow up drive stun somewhere around the belt region, you know, either into the lower back or into the buttocks. And that's going to, that's going to rock his world. That's going to lock him up. That's going to achieve not only NMI, but holy shit. I mean, can you imagine feeling the taser cycle going? through your damn head. <laughs> I mean, I've taken a taser exposure like three times, four times, I think. Um, like, 
if you've never been tased before, um, man, it's, it's hard to explain it. Um, like you can feel the pulses from the unit going through your body, um, or in, in between those contact points. Um, you know, maybe if you was in a, uh, growing up in a rural area and you touched an electric fence, um, you could you could feel that pulsing that doop 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 doop. Of course, with a taser, it's a lot faster. Um, if you've never touched electricity or anything like that before, it's really hard to explain it. But um, but shit, if you have experienced it, just imagine like holy fuck, like what would that feel like if you got probes in your head and now you've got the pulses originating in your skull and then going down through the rest of your body. So that alone, just popping them in the head like that is probably going to get some type of desired effect. I mean, yeah, it's going to be super, super painful, but holy shit, it's going to be very decentralizing for that person. Um, so that's one option there. Uh, if he can't do a uh, escape out of that uh, side control there. Another option is... Um, an edged weapon. So there's a lot of officers out there who will carry an edged weapon on their duty belt to the front, um, usually behind the magazine, or some will keep um, an edged weapon in their in their pocket, uh, like a folding knife. So let's say folding knife. Let's say he had a folding knife in his left pocket. He was able to get it out, switch that thing open. Um, then he can start stabbing that guy in the side. Um, to get him off of him a folding knife um, there could be some issues trying to get it out and locked open under stress uh, there's something you gotta finick with one-handed under stress so it may not be the best thing to be able to try and bring out in a fight but it's something that could be brought out in a fight like that because at this point like I said deadly physical force is now justified this dude is trying to take his gun away from him and he's not trying to take his gun away from him because he's planning on taking it to the pawn shop and selling it he's trying to take it away from him to kill him with it um the other way to introduce an edged weapon is a fixed blade knife that is carried on the duty belt and usually this is done in a way where it is positioned behind the uh, the magazine pouch. So uh, a K-Bar TDI is one product. And that is actually a product that I used to carry um, way back in the day. Uh, the other uh, products out there, I cannot remember the name um, of them. And I'm trying to do a real quick search on them. To see if I can find what that name is for the one that looks like a little a dagger, but I just cannot remember the name of it. Uh, but anyway, the the K Bar TDI knife that I had um, it was a fixed blade knife, and I carried it support side behind the magazine, and I liked it. But my problem with it was not really the knife itself, but rather the the holder that it came in, the sheath. Um, there was no retention to it. It was just, you know, Kydex and it's a basic, basically a, you know, passive retention type of, um, um, hold to it. There was no security strap over it. So it was basically just the same as using, um, like a real basic Kydex gun holster that just holds the gun in by a little bit of tension. There's no, uh, res security retention, device on it whatsoever you can just reach down and pull it out of the holster um and so there was a night where um there's a fight um i'm rolling on the ground with some people um and then after the fight i do a self pat down and the knife's gone i don't know where the hell it's at <laughs> so um I go to look for it and I find it and it's just laying on the ground. Luckily no one picked the damn thing up and, and stole it or tried to, um, you know, use it against anybody or anything like that. But that, that was the night that I 
I decided to stop carrying that TDI uh, because the realization sunk in that someone could have took that and used it against me very easily. And it came out very easily. Now, um, that was the sheath that it came with. So now, you know, I know other people make sheaths for it. Um, as far as like concealed carry stuff goes and all that, you can have like an inside the waistband uh, sheath for it. But to my knowledge, and I could be wrong, but to my knowledge, no one makes a security retention knife holster for like the TDI or the other ones. They're all just, you know, passive um, retention where it's just held in there by tension only. So that's why I've stopped carrying it. Um, but you know, if someone could make a, a really great holster for it that had some type of um, security retention device built into it where you just couldn't grab the handle of the knife and pull it out, I would probably consider carrying it again. Uh, but until then, it's just too much of a, a risk for me to, to, to carry that thing. Um, there are other places that, um, that allow or disallow their officers to carry these things. Uh, some agencies, they don't have policies on it. They don't care. Uh, they say it's okay, and the officers will carry them. There's other departments that will say that it's not okay for them to carry it, and they will not allow them to carry it at all. And sometimes their justifications for that uh, are, um, well, that's not anything that you receive training on it at the academy, and because you're not trained on it and certified on it, it's not something that you can carry. I can understand their point of view on that, right? Um, but if there's nothing in writing that allows for them to go take a class and then bring that documentation back that they took a class, then I think that's a problem. Uh, they should be able to, if they want to, go to a class, take a class um, on you know using a, a weapon like that, and then be able to bring that documentation back to the agency and say, hey, I've been to this class, it was so many hours, you know, yada, yada, yada. And then that agency should allow them to carry that thing on duty. Um, if they don't, then the agency's, I think, is a little wrong. Um, there are some places, some people that will say that using a knife in self-defense could be viewed as more barbaric by a jury. Just the the nature of the knife itself, it's something that is very personal, like you have to be at bad breath distance with someone, like you gotta be right up on them to stab them with it. Um, and usually it's not just one stab that works, like you gotta do a few pokes. And so that, that could what people say is, is that could look bad to a jury and a jury could see that as being barbaric and, and almost murderous. Whereas something like a pistol is, I guess you could say is more seen as like clinical or surgical. Um, and it's not as, you know, as personal and not like all up in their face and then pumping them full of lead. Uh, you can do it from a little bit of a distance as if that's any different than, than stabbing them. Um, I personally don't. I don't see that as a very strong argument, um, but I will say that I could see how some people could see the use of a knife as being more cavemanish. I guess you could say, because there is going to be a lot more fucking blood involved. Um, and there's going to generally be multiple holes in a person from a knife but there could also be multiple holes in a person from a gun as well um but that's that's what you get when you when you deal with a jury and you know they say you know the jury is a uh, is a jury of your peers they're not they they don't they don't fucking train they don't they don't carry guns they don't carry knives they don't do any of the self-defense training they don't they don't work in the field of law enforcement or security or they're not uh, you know 
in the lifestyle of, you know, being a, you know, armed citizen and, and going down this martial lifestyle of, of self-defense. They don't, you know, train on this stuff, read on this stuff, none of that. Um, so they're not a jury of your peer. Um, and juries in general, people in general are just, they're stupid. I mean, downright stupid. I have, I've been called to jury duty twice. And, um, you know, at the beginning, uh, everyone gets together, you know, they all got to come in, um, and then they'll swear you all in. And, um, then they'll ask people a bunch of questions. And, um, this is just the attorneys trying to get an idea of, you know, who they would like to be able to, um, select as a as a juror to sit on cases. Um, and so during this process, you can hear, you know, everyone's, you know, responses to stuff. And like, there are people, man, like the times I sat in there and I listened to some of the shit people said, like there was a couple people that I, I seriously wondered it, like, were they capable of fucking walking and chewing bubble gum at the same time? I mean, they were fucking retarded. <laughs> And these and these motherfuckers got picked to sit on a trial. I felt bad for whoever it was they sit on. Like that's that that, that that was that's scary. It is fucking scary to think that that people who who wear these little cat ear things and and put little furry butt plugs on their butt that have a tail on it and go pee in a fucking kitty litter box can go sit on a jury. That is fucking terrifying to think about. It really is. It is, it is, it's like when people say they'd rather be carried by 12 than, or I'm sorry, be uh, tried by 12 than carried by six. Shit, man, I, I don't know. Like in some places being tried by 12 is just the same as being carried by six. Like you're fucked, you're done. Um, and you can see that in some cases across the U.S. where the jury got it wrong and the jury was just a bunch of buffoons and it was all, you know, politicalized and like, it's, it's scary. It really is. But I'm getting off topic on, on the jury stuff a little bit, but, uh, <clears throat> the edge weapons were, uh, option. So that is an option, but, uh, just know that there are some concerns with, uh, some edge weapons there. All right. So moving on from here. You don't have authority over me. You don't have authority over me. Not reach for my fucking. You don't have authority over me. Okay, my dear. Okay, you're not yours. You're not alive. You're on the ground, Dave. No, I'm not. No, no, I'm not. I didn't do anything. No, I didn't do anything. Let it go. No, let it go. No, let it go. Let it go. Let it go. Let it go. I didn't do anything. Wow. Are you able to grab your taser, sir? I didn't do anything. Let this fucking gun go, you dumbass. Let it go. I'll fuck you up. Let it go. Stop. So this trooper, <laughs> random side comment, this trooper looks like the officer off of that TV show, uh, Southland. Uh, the guy who was like the field training officer. I can't remember his name, but he looks like that guy. Uh, anyway, so let's go back into this good Samaritan that pulls up. So good on this guy. Uh, I'll go ahead and tell you this guy, he does security work. Um, and he was there and he saw this going on and he, he got out and helped out. Uh, good on him. Good on him for recognizing that there's a problem and there needed to be a solution to that problem. Um, there was an emergency and he acted on it. So many other people, what would they be doing? They'd be standing there with their fucking phone out recording it. 
Like those people, I hate those people. Like I wish I could just go up and smack the fucking shit out of those dumbass people, take their phone and just fucking break it right there in front of their face. Those people are oxygen thieves. They are physically capable people who can who can bring a solution to a problem, but they don't. They just stand around and record with their phones. I hate those people with a passion. So good on this guy for not being an oxygen thief like that. Um, now this guy works security. I don't know what kind of security work he does. He just says in, in his interview that he does security work. Um, not a... I don't think that he was on his way to a security job site. If he was, then there's some issues with, you know, the clothing he's wearing. But in general, uh, clothes that you wear out in public, um, this is not the stuff that, that you need to be wearing. Uh, the pants can fall. I mean, these look like sweatpants. They fall down too easily. Um, and if they fall down too easily, they're going to impede your ability to have good movement, uh, et cetera. And of course, there's no way to have a good inside the waistband holster with pants like this because it's just not going to work. Um, I mean, you can have a um, um, an ulti clip; they could clip into the the pants there, but because they're sweatpants, it's going to be a lot of sagging, and then it's just going to end up the pants falling down on you. Now, of course, you could have something like an Enigma holster or something like that under sweatpants but again the issue goes back into the sweatpants are just too easy to fall down and that impedes your movements and you can end up looking like a fool with your pants on the ground so uh, certainly think that he could have had some some better attire on uh, but nonetheless like I said uh, good on him for stopping and doing something and bringing a, a good resolution to this you know if it wasn't for this guy right here there's the potential that this dude could have got that trooper's gun out and potentially used it on the trooper. There's lots of law enforcement officers out there throughout history who've been killed in the line of duty with their own gun. Happens more than what you think. Oh, are you able to grab your taser, sir? Oh, I didn't do anything. Grab well, his well, fucking gun, well, you dumbass. Well, you gotta you gotta call call I'll fuck you up. So at this point, there's no reason to be threatening for us. There's really not. Like, this is green light. You could literally just go up and just start punching the fuck out of someone. He could have come up there with a, a bat and just hit this dude in the fucking head. Are the police going to do anything to you? Hell no. I ain't going to do anything to you. You just fucking saved an officer's life. So, like, this is the moment where anyone, like, you could, you could, in this particular kind of scenario, you could have used any level of force you wanted to, and you would have been perfectly fine. Like, they are not going to charge you for anything. Um, and from the realistic standpoint, there's no negotiating going on with this. Like, there's no talking to this person and and getting any kind of reasoning out of them. You're wasting your breath in this kind of scenario trying to talk to someone and tell them, you better do this or else. No. You're wasting time. Do work. Um, Seriously? I didn't do anything. Well, I'm not going to stop. Stop, man. Stop. 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 I'm going to go to the hospital. 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 I'm going
So you can hear the cavalry coming. Um, in this kind of scenario, um, you know, the officer, which I can't hear very well what's going on in the background, but the officer is talking on the radio. He needs to make it very clear that he has a good Samaritan helping because uh, that's going to allow the other officers arriving to know that this guy's not a threat because there's the potential that soon as someone gets there, he does not look like he's there to help. I mean, he's wearing regular street clothes. He may work security, but he's not in a security uniform. That's not something that they would be able to easily recognize and say, oh, well, this is a good guy. No, he looks like anyone else on the street. He's got a, you know, uh, a toboggan on that, you know, doesn't look like any type of, you know, uniform kind of thing. Uh, he's got his, um, his sweatshirt uh, jacket thing on. He's got sweatpants on. You know, like he does not look like anyone uh, from a security company or, or, or an agency or anything like that. Um, and you can't see it here in the um, um, footage, but he does have a lot of facial piercing as well. And so, you know, when if an officer gets there and they see him, they're going to know right away, like, this dude's not an off-duty officer. He, like, he's not, you know, like... It's not going to be very clear at first that this guy was there helping. So um, if the trooper had called out on the radio and said that, you know, there's a good Samaritan help me, uh, you know, then good. Um, if not, then I think that's something that should have been done. So this guy right here, uh, what he, what should he be doing? Um, well, he should be very mindful of the fact that there's a possibility he could have guns pointed at him. Because like I said, once they get there, they're not going to have a clue who he is. Um, so if you uh, if you have the inclination to be the one to go help an officer when they're in trouble, and you know you're just a regular Joe, that's something you need to be aware of. Is when the other backup gets there, you're not dressed like everyone else. You don't have a badge on your chest. You don't get arm patches on. You know, you ain't got a duty belt on. You don't look like a friendly. You could be a suspect. So you're going to potentially have a taser pointed at you, a gun pointed at you. People will be yelling at you. You'll be told to get on the ground, etc. So have that in mind. Um, what else, what, what could he be doing at this point as well? Um, you know, we see his right hand coming up and he wipes his face with it some. So we know that his right hand is not doing anything critical. Uh, as they're coming up, he can even put that right hand up and show it. Um, at least have that one hand clear. If he's using his left hand to help press that guy down, then I think at that moment he should keep it down where he's got it and help pressing that guy down until he is told otherwise. Like, hey, put both your hands up. Then he should immediately go ahead and put both hands up. Um, but as those people are arriving, he go ahead and raise one hand up. And as they get out of the car, he can verbalize, hey, I'm helping out. And then that trooper there may say something like, yeah, he's helping me. Um, that way the other ones will know, all right, cool, this guy's a good guy. Don't tase him. So, cool on that. I, you know, I said raise your right hand. Um, I haven't watched it this far yet, but uh, raises his hand up. Signifies to them that, you know, he's not a threat. So, he recognizes the fact that they're starting to take over and he's backing off. Uh, what could he be doing at this point? I think getting a little bit further away from what's going on because there's going to be more people showing up and they're not going to know who the hell this guy is, what's going on. And again, some of those more options that I talked about could be happening uh, or they could just, you know, someone else come up and be like, hey, what are you doing here? Hey, 
go go over there get away from here um so go ahead and self-initiate that and just get away from that immediate area he obviously had a car that he came in there with so the best thing he could do at this point if they're there taking over just go back to the car and wait for someone else to come talk to him and he can give him his name and info and and be a witness on the citation and all that Okay, so here is the um, Minnesota Department of Transportation camera that I was talking about. So we can see here at the beginning, um, the car is right here, and you see these uh, gouge marks here in the ground where he's gone <laughs> through it and then hit this wall right here. If it weren't for this wall right here, he would have been going off the other side uh, down here. Um, this person has stopped, obviously, to see if there's you know any help that could be rendered, and of course this person is stopping to help too. Um, you know, being a being a good citizen is is good for society. You know, wanting to stop and help people, right? Like that's the natural instinct of good people to want to stop and help someone else who is in need of help. Especially when you see something like a car wreck. Um, but there are some potential dangers when it comes to um, helping someone who's been involved in a car wreck. Number one, the reason for them being in the car wreck could be due to the fact that they're intoxicated. And, or, uh, they could be intoxicated on alcohol or they could be intoxicated on some kind of drug. And they could be someone who is wanted. They know they're wanted by police, etc. And so, uh, these people could, you know, become very belligerent, um, not want your help, become aggressive towards you. They, in their drunken stupor or their extreme level of being high, may think that you are the police and will try to attack you. They may try to uh, attack you and steal your car because they know that they're probably going to be going to jail. <clears throat> so you can see there that he's... Um, attacking um and it's not the greatest angle from this camera angle but it still shows kind of a different perspective of of what's going on um so when you go to to stop to help someone um you should be aware of the fact that just because they've been involved in an accident it doesn't mean that they're not a threat they could become a threat at any moment
So those rear lights are pretty good. It, and realistically, it makes me think that these little license plate lights are just a waste of money. It's funny how you progress in life because I used to think that all the lights, you know, were good. Um, now I see them as being just too fucking much. <laughs> I mean, why you need a, why you need these little tiny ass license plate lights to flash forward when these damn things are, are bright as shit? All right, so that's it on this on the Calvary showing up. So let's go watch his uh, his news interview. All right, so this news interview comes from Fox Nine. Williams seems unfazed by it all. It's because he was a security guard for years. He's seen a lot. I used to do security in rough areas, so it's all in a day's work, but for free for this time. <laughs> <laughs> so, right. me just giving back, I guess. Williams said he was just glad everyone was okay in the end, as was the trooper he helped and all the officers who were on scene to wrap things up. He caught his breath. He was real relieved. And I just, I shook everybody's hand and everybody wanted me to stay and they thanked me and stuff. Felt good, but I'd do it again. We are so thankful that this Good Samaritan stopped and demonstrated the best of Minnesotans. All right, and so here is some information um, from the courts on this guy. Um, <clears throat> so Matthew William Cleave, date of birth, 7-12 of 82. Here's his address. It's fun stuff, right? Uh, count one, charge, possession of ammo, any firearm, conviction, or adjudicated delinquent for crime or violence um he this occurred on um that date 1 3 2021 so i guess uh that this possess of ammo any firearm um was him grabbing hold of the trooper's gun um and so that's what that state's charge would be now of course not every state's going to have a charge that says this exact same thing but this is what they charged him with. Um, count two is assault fourth on the peace officer um, with a demonstrable bodily harm. And then the third charge is disarming a peace officer uh, or take defensive device from peace officer area controlled by officer. So most places, most states will have a disarming a peace officer charge. Um, the assault stuff varies from state to state. Um, here in Kentucky, it would be a, an assault third instead of assault fourth. Um, and then this this one up here, you know, we don't have anything in Kentucky that sounds or, or is worded like that. Um, we would just have um, uh, a, a firearm or a possession of firearm by convicted felon, you know, if this guy was a convicted felon. Um So here's the statement of the probable cause. Uh, on or about January 3rd, 2021, approximately 8.30 p.m., Minnesota State Trooper T.R. was on patrol when he observed a Honda Accord vehicle, license plate 668 PBR, that had crashed into a retaining wall off of Highway 252 near 70th, 70th, 70th Street in Brooklyn Center, Hennepin County, Minnesota. Uh, from the tire tracks, it appeared the vehicle was traveling northbound but crossed the center median and southbound lanes going into the ditch. The vehicle was still in drive and the tires were spinning. Uh, there was no one inside the vehicle and the front driver's door was open. A bystander pointed at a male walking from the vehicle a short distance away. The male was later identified as Matthew William Cleave. Trooper T.R. approached the defendant and told him to stop, but the defendant did not comply and started walking away. As Trooper T.R. attempted to detain the 
the defendant, the defendant suddenly punched Trooper TR in the face and drug the trooper to the ground. The defendant was on top of the trooper and had him pinned down. The defendant tried to grab the trooper's handgun. Trooper TR yelled at the defendant multiple times to stop reaching for his gun, but defendant ignored the trooper's commands and continued to grab the trooper's firearm. As they continued to struggle over the firearm, a bystander came over and helped the trooper. The bystander grabbed the defendant's arm and placed him in a headlock. With help from the bystander, Trooper TR was eventually able to restrain the defendant. Other officers arrived and eventually handcuffed the defendant. Trooper TR had red marks and scrapes on his face and leg from the altercation. Officers spoke with the male bystander. The bystander stated he observed the defendant's vehicle crash into the ditch. The defendant exited the driver's seat and asked for a ride, but did not, but did not want to stay for police. When the defendant saw the police car, he started walking away. The bystander stated he saw the defendant fighting with the trooper, so he went to help. As the bystander approached, he saw a defendant grabbing a trooper uh, firearm, attempting to unholster the weapon. Bystander yelled to him to stop and punch the defendant, but the defendant would not comply. The bystander then placed the defendant in the headlock and restrained his hands. They were eventually able to restrain the defendant until other officers arrived. Officers observed defendant's eyes were watery and glossy. Defendant was speaking incoherently and appeared under the influence of controlled substance. Defendant was taken to hospital for blood for blood tests. Officers obtained a search warrant and asked the defendant to submit to a blood test. Defendant refused a blood test but agreed to a urine test. At approximately 10.50 p.m., officers obtained a urine sample from the defendant. Results are pending. Defendant's driver license was canceled. Um... To public safety at the time, the defendant has felony convictions for second-degree assault on June 9, 2002 in Stearns County, file number blah, 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 and possession of controlled substance on February 14, 2006 in Hennepin County, blah, blah, blah. He also has three prior TWI convictions dating back to 2006. <laughs> yeah. Complainant requests that defendant subject to bail conditions release be arrested and that other lawful steps be taken to obtain his appearance in court or detained in the custody, blah, blah, blah. Uh, did it give the bond info? Yeah, so uh, down here he had a $50,000 bond, but they changed that and it was $25,000. Um, and he only had to pay a, a small percent of it. So, of course, you know, he was able to make bond, um, which unfortunately happens too easily for some people um, many times. And this is just a, a sheet about him, and then this is um, the stuff that he's been um, charged with. All right, so you would think that uh, someone like this would have gotten, you know, some time for what he did. Well, you're going to be disappointed. So that same year, December 21st, he was sentenced for attacking the Minnesota State Trooper in early January. He pled guilty on November 1 to felony fourth degree aggravated assault on a peace officer and attempting to disarm a peace officer and a misdemeanor DWI. As part of his sentence, he was placed on probation for three years and has a stayed sentence of 366 days. He will also need to abstain from any drug or alcohol use, be randomly drug tested, and must attend DWI victim impact panel. He received 38 days of credit for time served 38 days credit time served this cocksucking motherfucker did a month in jail a big whopping month in jail and then got only three years of probation that's it that is it the month he spent in jail was him, you know, waiting for his bond to get to a certain amount that he could pay it. And then he was out. And practically almost, you know, this and this was the, the very beginning of January of that year. 
January 3rd, and then boom, this uh, sentencing occurs on December 21st. He only spent practically 30 days in jail for what he did, and then three years probation. With the prior history of assaulting people and other DUIs. Like, what the f- like, and this is this is not unique. This is not peculiar. This goes on everywhere. I get it's crazy. It is. It is. It is. It is fucking crazy how the courts do stuff. Like everyone wants to think that gangbangers and shit are the problem. You know, after several years of, you know, seeing shit like this, I'm honestly starting to see the courts as the danger to society. I really am. Like, why would you give someone like this such leniency? It makes no sense whatsoever. None. It almost, like, and I, I joke and say it, but hell, I'm, it almost sounds like it could be true. Like, what are these judges and prosecutors doing? Are they fucking smoking crack? Like, like, how? How does this happen? This dude's prior felonies is one thing, but the fact that he tr- was trying to take the gun from that trooper and kill him with it, and all he gets is time credit for time served and being in the jail, And three years probation. How how do how the hell does that make sense? Now what's interesting is it wasn't too long after this this guy got arrested again. <laughs> Go figure, right? Give a mouse a cookie and then he'll want a glass of milk. All right. So that's it for this video. Uh, if you like what you hear and see, go ahead and give me a like and a share. If you have not already, hit the subscribe button and stay tuned for more Monday quarterback videos. Earl Henderson, Primordial Defense, thank you for watching.